at some point or another, we've all said it to ourselves, man, I want to be like those people on TV and play a professional sport. But while many of us say we want that, not all of us are committed to doing what it takes. Our guest today had exactly what it took. He put in the work and he played in the NFL. I'm your host, Miles Biggs. You are listening to Relish the Journey, and you are about to hear from Dominic Rufran, former NFL player and current awesome human. Let's get into it. All right, Dominic, welcome to Relish the Journey, my friend. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So for people who have never heard the name Dominic Rufran before, right? they don't know anything about you, how do you introduce yourself to people when you first meet them? What's your uh, elevator pitch or you know your DM, right? How should we uh, intro you to the folks that are listening? No, that's actually a great question. Only because most people, when they introduce themselves, they always start with their job. And it's always amazing to me that people start with what they do for work. And people always talk about like, hey, you should you follow your passion or don't follow your passion. Like, I don't even know how that's even an argument. When you spend a majority of your time doing something, let's say 40 hours plus a week, that's, that's a third of your life. And we're having a, a conversation about, should I follow my passion? Should I not? Should I do what makes me happy? Should I do where my purpose and passion lies? And then we come back and ask, Hey, what is it that you do? And the first thing you mentioned is your work that should be a direct correlation that your work is who you are as a human being, right? And so I'm not going to start there with what I do for work just because I just mentioned this and it's cliche, (laughs) but I will get, but I, but I, but I will get to it. Um, and so I am first and foremost, a man of faith. Um, I gave my life to Christ when I was 18 and that completely changed my life. And that is my foundation. And that's my rock. Um, I grew up in Colorado. Um, my entire life was based around athletics Athletics, everything I knew from the age of two all the way probably until the age of around 23, devoted my life day in and day out, chasing a dream of playing in the NFL. And through that process, that developed me into become the man who I am today. I didn't know it during that time, but every lesson that I learned through sports has challenged me to be the man that I am right now. I'm completely thankful for the path that I went down to get to where I'm at. Although in the moment, I always thought that I was going to play in the NFL for 10 plus years, be a pro bowler, be in the NFL for a long time and be a legend. And it didn't work out that way. Um, I ended up playing for a very small amount of time, but I'm honestly grateful for that opportunity and for the amount of time that I went in. Because if I would have went in for longer than I had planned, you know, I may have lost my soul. I may have went to a place that I didn't want to go down, a dark, depressive state, um, I wouldn't be the man who I am now. I wouldn't have the friends, the relationships that I have now. Uh, I wouldn't have the spouse that I have now. Like there's so many things that I may not have had right now. If I were to have made it into the NFL for a long period of time. And so ultimately like a man of faith, a man of courage, super bold. Um, you know, I like to slay and attack fear and, uh, I have a passion now of helping other athletes and other individuals transition from one thing to the next, because when I made that transition from athletics to life after sports, I struggled. I had an identity crisis because my identity was wrapped up in sports and football for so long and trying to find out who I was as a human after football was gone. It was just tough. What do I want to do? Who am I? Why am I here? Like, what am I trying to accomplish? What skills do I have? Like, what am I even good at? And all these questions just came through over and over and over. And on top of that, I had to deal with the insecurities of trying to figure out who I was as a man, not knowing what's next. And also the, the feeling of feeling insignificant because when you're playing ball and you're doing well, everybody knows your name, everybody's sliding in your DMs, you know, like you were talking about at the beginning and they're, they're praising you, they're loving you, they're saying congratulations, you're doing awesome, be your thing. And then when you're done, nobody cares. Like nobody's reaching out, nobody's asking about you. Nobody wants to know anything about you. All they want to know is like, what happened? How could you even play longer? And so I am no longer identify myself as a, as a athlete. Um, I am a, a former athlete who still has tendencies of the athletic mindset. Um, and now today uh, I have a podcast, um, that really shapes that, that concept of helping athletes make that transition. 
And I spend the majority of my time now learning about money, finance, and teaching people how to live an intentional life using money as a tool. So I hope that helps you define who I am. Sure. Yeah, and I knew all that, but I have to ask for the people that don't know you, right? So I think that was a great um, a great <laughs> summary for the people that are just getting acquainted with you here on the podcast. Yeah, it might have uh, might have been a little longer than elevator ride, maybe uh, <laughs> That's the like es- a Vegas one. The escalator and pitch. And you had to stop, stop, it's, yeah, stop on every floor. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Well, I'm, I'm curious about that. It's one of the things I want to touch on, um, on with you, right? So previously to just recently, you were on a live stream show that I'm a part of with Dave Cooper on LinkedIn. And we ended up talking so much about football on there that after that conversation, reflecting on that and getting ready for this conversation – Something I wanted to ask you was about that identity. And you, you just said you don't identify as an athlete anymore, right? But do you ever get tired of people just introducing you as, here's Dom, he's the former NFL player, like just leading with that. And that's kind of the, the first thing that gets thrown out. And you that was you glossed over that part so, so much in everything you just said, right? You're so much more than that. But that tends to be like the, the sexy soundbite, right? I'm talking to a former NFL player. Does that ever get old? That is a great question, and I never had that question answered before, nor have I actually taken the time to reflect on that question as when people introduce me on it, how does it make me feel? Because I think I've just become so numb to it and so used to it as that is just what people say. So it just almost becomes like it's, it's, it's just your name, right? When somebody's like, yo, what's your name? You're like, my name's Miles. Yo, what's your name? My name's Dom. And so if someone introduces you like, oh, this is Dom. He used to play football at the University of Wyoming. Or, oh, this is Dom. He used to play football in the NFL. Like, you just automatically assume that's just the natural tendencies, right? right? And so if I were to think back on it internally, um, I would say, okay, should I really be affected or should I really care that much about somebody introducing me that way? And I would say no. Um, and I know that I'm way more than that. And I know I'm way deeper and have way more substance to it. Um, but if that's how somebody sees me, then that's how somebody sees me. And and, you know, my job is to change that persona of my identity to how people see me. So instead of it being, hey, this is Dom that is a former NFL athlete. Hey, this is Dom. He's an amazing human being. He's an amazing man. Um, he's a strong faith. You know, he's here to help. He adds a ton of value to people. And when I can start getting to that place, that means I've done my job. And so it just if people are introducing me as that skill and that's the first thing they think about, well, maybe I just need to personally need to do a better job of um, changing their thought process on who they see me as a human. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Put the onus back on you, which doesn't surprise me at all with you. That's how you roll. Uh, you're not an excuses type guy by any means. Yeah. I, uh, I just read the the book, uh, extreme ownership, uh, okay. by Jocko, uh, Jocko yeah, by Jocko Lonick. And, yeah. uh, it's incredible. Um, you know, it's just him talking about taking extreme ownership and everything in your life. And if you can accept that and realize that everything is your fault, then you have the control and the power to change anything. The second you start blaming other people or start blaming somebody else for whatever circumstance you have is the instant that you let go of complete control and you're now a victim and you're now trapped in whatever circumstances that you're in. So if I say I I can't do this because of this person, well, now I'm officially stuck there and there's no way out because I can't change the other individual. But if I say, oh, this is me, I have to change. I need to be the better individual. I can now go dissect what I need to do to become a better human being. So by being in extreme ownership mode, you will always, always, always have the upper hand. And, you know, it's even coming back to the little things of just apologizing and saying, hey, this is my fault and saying, oh, this wasn't because of X, Y, Z factors this was like all me like i need to be better and by owning up and saying i need to be better and i will do better people see that in a and they respect it they respect it way more than you making an excuse for yourself oh for sure yeah that's a great book that and uh discipline equals freedom by jocko as well if you haven't read that one i recommend that one that's good dude just anything with jocko in general is great yeah uh, his podcast is awesome like he's it just is. a great dude all of i mean you, you plug into youtube he's got some fire clips there Oh yeah, um, have you overall, seen the one, just, uh, the one of him with the good? Have you watched that video? If you, um, if you just Google Jocko, I can think if you of. Google Jocko Willing good, it's awesome. It's like a short three minute video. It's gonna make you want to run, run through a wall, where he's talking about like so and so ran in and was like boss, boss, boss. You know, 
this didn't happen, this didn't happen. And he's like, I just looked at him and said, good. <laughs> in, his, <laughs> in his Jocko voice, he's like, more time to get better. <laughs> uh, all right i think awesome. right after this i'll have to uh, yeah definitely check it out so uh, talking about getting better right i'll use it as a segue you said you were an athlete from two to 20s and you you committed yourself to the sport you, you made it to the nfl you know what does that look like yeah i think a lot of that gets glorified in movies on um, you know the guy that's busting his butt and training to get to that momentous occasion, but in real life and actuality, what is it like to, to pursue a professional football career from the age of two to when it actually happens? Well, going back to even as early as two, like I remember literally watching Monday night football with my dad thinking that's going to be me. That's going to be me who watching Terrell Davis doing push-ups, playing catch with him all the time playing football with my cousins, right? I remember being three and four years old in preschool where kids are literally still crapping their pants and I'm literally bringing a football to school and all I want to do is play. And my teacher would have to bribe me and say, hey, if you want to play football, you need to go to sleep. You need to take a nap. And like all these other kids are just taking a nap like normal little kids. And I'm just anxious to play football. And so I would fake like I'm going to sleep so then I could wake up and then they would let me play football. And so like that's ages of three and four. And then all of a sudden I get older and um, you, the teacher asks you, hey, what do you want to be when you get older? And I say, hey, I want to play in the NFL. And they say, all right, well, let's pick something realistic. And I say, that is realistic. Like, that's all I want to do. Like, that's what I want to play. And then I tell my grandma, like, I want to play in the NFL. And she's like, hey, you probably need to become a doctor or a lawyer or do something along those lines, something where you can become successful. I'm like, well, the NFL is really what I want to do. And then, you know, I get to college and or I'm, I'm in the, the process of picking a college and I get in this argument with my sister and uh, I can either go to the University of Wyoming or go to Air Force. And I told her I picked the University of Wyoming over Air Force and she's the dumbest decision you could ever make. Like when you get out, you could have benefits, you could have job security, you'll have a job for forever. And I'm like, to me, it's not about that. Like, I want to play in the NFL at Air Force. They require you to serve. It's really hard to make it in there. They don't pass the football. Like you're, you, you, to make it in the NFL and the Air Force is pretty much impossible. Like that's not my path. And so we, that's the first time me and her like really ever fought in our entire life. And it was really strange. But it just shows like the adversity of the relationships that I had with the people who cared about me, who had my best interests, that were always trying to quote unquote thought they were helping me, but really they were against me without even realizing it subconsciously, right? Yeah. Um, and so the thing about it is when I was in high school, I sacrificed so much. And then when I got to college, I sacrificed even more. And so I was not incredibly gifted as in like athletically gifted above and beyond other people in, in the country. There was other people who were faster, other people were stronger. Maybe in like my city and town, I may have been athletically gifted, but in general, I was not above and beyond athletically greater than everybody else. Um, I still remember in like middle school, there were so many kids faster than me. And like, I just kept training, training and training. But what ended up happening was the kids that stopped training, I would keep training and I just started passing everybody speed wise, athleticism. I keep working out every day, every day. Um, I would, I would even go home and every night I would sleep with my football. I'd play Madden and justify it that I was using it mentally to help me read holes. (laughs) So what I'm trying to get, what I'm trying to get at is everything that I did, every single thing I did revolved around the game of football. It did not matter what it was. What other kids were, you know, going and, and hiking and doing cars and uh, snowboarding and skiing with, with, with their families and stuff. My family did not have the money to do any of that. Right? I got free lunch, free sports, and we did the sports that cost no money. And I devoted my life every day to the game of football and other sports. I did track and basketball and things like that, but football was always on my mind and that's what revolved around. And so when you can find something in your life that you're so passionate about and you're so driven towards, you wake up every day and chase that dream like you're on fire, it is inevitable that you will achieve it at some degree or another. And that is with any business, any goal, whatever it is that you have in this life, if you chase it wholeheartedly and devote your entire life to it, it will happen. The problem is, is most people never find that North Star. They never find something that they're so passionate about where they just wake up every day and that's all they think about. They literally wake up and they dread their life and they get to the Friday and they say, thank God it's Friday so that they can enjoy their Saturday and half of Sunday um, and then have that pit in their stomach going into it and going into Monday. 
And that's not the life that people need or should live if they want to achieve something of significance. And so even in high school, like I devoted everything to lifting by myself every morning, going to the gym, sprints, right? Even my friends that said they wanted to play in the NFL, they would not do what I was willing to do to achieve that. I worked so hard. It was unreal. And I did extra reps. Everything extra revolved around that sport. So I ended up getting a, a Division One scholarship to play at the University of Wyoming. And the same story happened. Uh, it did not matter when and where. I was the guy that was devoting my entire life to trying to achieve something. And when I got to college, I realized how insignificant I was and how much work that I really had to do. Talent-wise and technique-wise, I was so far behind the curve. It's because I had no teacher, no mentor, no guidance going into that. So I had to learn these skill sets on my own or through other mentors in college or through uh, other colleagues who are already at a higher level than me. And so when we had off days, like I would go to the field by myself for like five, six hours and run the same route over and over and over and over again. And I would train and do everything that I possibly could. And, you know, I did a lot of things wrong, right? Maybe I didn't devote myself to the same, that I, to the, the way I should have been in the weight room sometimes because I didn't agree with the workout. Um, like I was a huge fan of like not loading my spine as much. And so I would like try to avoid some of that stuff or um, I wouldn't eat the greatest because I was trying to gain weight. So I'd like do McDonald's or Taco Bell, like whatever I could, plus it was a cheap, cheap meal. Um, but, you know, if I could do it all over again, I would have taken it way more seriously with um, the mindset of it, of learning about, how to properly eat, how to properly lift, and most importantly, how to properly sleep. And that's the other thing is if you don't have a strong mentor or somebody to guide you along the way, these are the things you just don't know. Like I'm a 17, 18 year old kid stepping on campus. Like how am I supposed to know all these things? I kind of have an idea, but nobody's telling me, right? So, you know, I sacrificed so much is in regards to like, uh, I was obsessed with video games going into college. Uh, I decided to sell my Xbox. So uh, I would no longer play because I knew I wasn't going to have time to be great at football and do that at the same time. Um, when it came to schoolwork, I sacrificed my schoolwork so I could spend more time studying film and watching film. Um, there was just uh, so many sacrifices that I had to make, right? Well, kids were going out partying and staying out and drinking. That wasn't me. Even still to this day, I have never been drunk before and never been high because of that exact reason of me not wanting to put anything bad in my body or me not wanting to take a workout away from myself and put in all that hard work and it going bad or destroying because I did something stupid. And so legitimately like for, from two to, you know, 22, 23, like I just devoted everything to, to becoming the greatest I could possibly be. Um, there were some factors along the way. Um, let's say like my senior year that did not go my way, uh, for a bunch of factors that prevented me probably from playing in the NFL for even longer. Um, which is why I think at this point it's, it was God's divine plan to slow me down and like take a, a deeper look at what the next plan was for me. And he had something bigger and better for me. Um, so yeah, if that uh, kind of paints the picture of how I got there and what it took, it was just a lot of sacrifice and a lot of discipline. And fortunately for me, like those same sacrifices and disciplines have now transferred over to who I am right now. Right. Yeah. You burned the boat, right? It was, there was no other option but playing the NFL for you. And it's something yeah. I think about as a dad now, right? Like the stories you said or people – you said to somebody, I want to play in the NFL. And they're like, oh, let's pick something more realistic. Like when I hear that now, like with my dad lens on, it's just like hope I don't say that to my son, right? Because so many people do that. Like you said, the people that live for a Friday are the people that are like – they tamped down whatever it is they really wanted to do, that passion, that thing they wanted to go after because they were told it was unrealistic – so now they're living this realistic life that they hate because they never felt like it was okay to go after what they wanted. Um, so it's awesome that you just pushed through that and said, you know, everyone be damned. I'm doing this thing. And you did it. Yeah. And, you know, sports is a very unique uh, industry because no matter who you are, you could be Tom Brady, you could be me, you could be whoever it is that you're playing in any sport. It's going to be a temp job, right? Uh, so which means that you can be the play in the NFL for not for long, which is what it stands for, which is less than three years, <laughs> or you can be Tom Brady and play for 15 plus years and just, you know, be the greatest of all time, but does not matter at some point it has got to end. So even if your plan a is to play in the NFL, you still have to have another plan at the end of it. And so here's what you can do with two, one of two ways is you can do option one is where you can just deal with it when the time comes or option B 
don't have a plan B, but just equip yourself to become the best human being you can possibly be in a ton of skills. Be a great reader, read books, network, learn, be around the right people, uh, learn a skill with drawing, writing, uh, playing music, instrument, become a well-rounded human being. And then when you're done, you have all these skills to equip you for whenever that transition in life has to happen. And that's what I always suggest to people. It's like, all right, if you want to play in the NFL, don't have a plan B. Make that your drive. Make that your purpose. But still make yourself the best human you can possibly be in all areas of life. And that will equip you for when you do make that transition. Now, when you have other industries that are a little bit different, like if you want to be a musician or something that you can do forever, um, you know, you really can devote your entire life to it if you're willing to sacrifice and sweat and tears. And, you know, when you don't make it, you can keep pushing. And if you're willing to, you know, eat dirt for a while and eventually make it, you can make it no matter what in this life. Um, I mean, obviously freak accidents can happen to where you can maybe lose vocal cords or, you know, if you're a surgeon, you lose your arm or something like that, right? Very, very, very unrealistic things happening. Um, but, you know, at that same point, you know, I still think that people should still become the best human they can be by filling their brain with the right things, being around the right people, um, and improving their environment and just learning all around. Um, because there's, there's enough time in this world to do other things besides whatever you're devoted to, but still put all of your passion and energy into that one thing still. Um, and if you find it, go for it. Uh, there's no, nothing better than it. Yeah. When you were just talking out, it reminded me of what you said earlier about, you know, other people stopped working out and you didn't. So you ca you caught them, you got faster. And it's the same with, like you said, reading books or just being a better human. So many people stop focusing on that kind of stuff at a certain age. It's just like, ah, I'm not going to read a book again ever. Right. <laughs> I think the average American, they say reads less than one book a year. So by reading two books a year, you're in effect, you know, already a leg up <laughs> on most of the United Gosh, States. <laughs> And then like CEOs read um, 60 books a year. So you just see that disparity. And whether it's football, they're like, I was a swimmer all through college. And so with swimming, it was all time-based. So literally, like if you weren't getting faster, you were getting slower because other people are getting faster, right? So the same thing, you could always get outworked. And that's true in sports, it's true in life. It's, uh, I just love that sort of mentality when you think about it that way. It makes it like, don't have a plan B, but like be your plan B. Like you as the human, you are plan mm. A, B, and C. I like that. And I like that. Yeah. It's, I like be it your too. plan it's, B. I like that. Yeah, your own plan B. Like no matter what happens to you, you've got you, right? That's one thing that's never going to change. People could take away everything, mm. but you still got you. So yeah, that's so good. And that's what I, I teach people now and I teach my clients. It's like, hey, you are your greatest asset. You're your number one asset. So treat it that way. And that's in health wealth, relationships, it doesn't matter. That's what you need to view yourself as. And so I always talk about investing back in yourself. Always put put money back in yourself. Put your time back in yourself. Put energy back in yourself. Put the people, right, people around you back in yourself. And those are the important things is realizing that if you have that mindset that you are your number one asset, you can become and achieve anything you want in life. Yeah, 100%. So you said in the very beginning on your, uh, your Vegas elevator pitch um, that – the transition was hard for you, leaving the sport, coming into the real world. So it, I'm going to just infer then that you didn't really have a plan B. You were all in on football. So how did you learn this, right? How did you feel like you had to go through some lows, I'm assuming, but what was the turning point for you where you figured all this out if it didn't happen you know, yeah, right away? <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting because you never think that it's going to hit you the way it does. I remember specifically having conversations with other people who just graduated and they were like, you have no idea the way it feels like when you're done. And for me, I was like, Oh no, like I'm a strong human. Like I'm strong in my foundation and my faith. Like that's not going to be me. I'm not going to struggle. And you know, I'm like, when this is over, I have plenty of ideas. There's plenty of things I can do. I can go start my own business. I can go start a gym. Like there's so many ways to make money. Like I'm the man, like I can do this. Right. And then all of a sudden it comes and it hits you like a ton of bricks you're just like, wow, like what is next? I do not have a plan at this moment in time. And so it's like, well, what do I do now? And at that point in time, you have to do one thing first and foremost, and you have to let yourself heal. You have to be okay with that pain. And you have to understand that you did devote your life to one thing for so long. And letting go of that thing is going to hurt. And having to understand that you're not going to ever play that sport again in the same way you did. And that it's okay to move on 
is something that is challenging to deal with, but you have to accept that, embrace it and feel that pain. No, it's just like if you were dating somebody for, you know, 15 years and then all of a sudden you had to let them go. No, it's painful and it hurts, but it's okay to let them go, but you have to heal through that process. So first you have to heal. And then once you heal, now you have to go out and start trying things. And when I first started, I, you know, I kind of got into a little bit of real estate. I was like, maybe I want to be a fix and flipper. And I was like, okay, like maybe that's actually not what I want to do. And then I like started doing uh, roofing as in, uh, I was going to run my dad's company and I was like, you know what? I don't really like this industry. So I kind of got away from that. And then uh, I was like, all right, well, I think I really want to be a, an owner of a gym. So I started interning for the Bronco strength and conditioning coach. And I realized I didn't like that. And I was like, okay, well, I do know I want to be an entrepreneur and I do know I want to be in sales and I do know I think about money a lot. So maybe I should get into that field. So I tried to keep, you know, finding something, finding something and nothing would hit. And uh, eventually uh, a door-to-door sales company was like, hey, like you can come work with us. And it was, you know, base plus commission. And I was like, awesome, great. Very, very, very small base. Um, And I was going door-to-door selling lawn care service. And I just did that. And I was like, this is a great place to start. Robert Kiyosaki and Jamie Foxx, people like that endorse going door to door because they believe that it builds skills, it builds uh, character, it teaches you how to talk to people. You know, you become somebody who's prepared for anything because you get your teeth knocked in. When you get your teeth knocked in and embraces you for life, you hear no, you hear rejection, you know, you overcome your fear. I still remember the first time I knocked on the door, I was shaking, dry mouth, could barely speak, didn't know what I was going to say. And eventually you just start doing it over and over and over again. And you just become better and better and better. Fear goes away. You stop caring about rejection. You start making more sales. And that's just the process. You know, you start seeing the progression of when I was a two-year-old kid doing push-ups, thinking that I was going to be in Monday Night Football. Like, I'm not back at the beginning again. I got to start over. You got to start somewhere. Like, it's the same process of you have to start over from the beginning. And so a lot of times people get into trouble when they're trying to find a career, they're trying to find a job is they feel like they need to be the CEO or they feel like they need to be at the top of the pinnacle, like right away, but you don't deserve that yet. Like, I don't know why people feel like they're so entitled to where they feel like they deserve to be at that place. Everybody has to eat dirt at some point in time. It does not matter who you are. You can look at Jeff Bezos. You see his picture of him at his desk with a little Amazon, you know, uh, banner in the background and it's just him right he ate dirt for a while and that's what you have to do it doesn't matter where you're going you have to eat dirt and accept that so i ended up doing that just trying things out keep trying things and you know before i knew it i'm getting involved in the the finance world the insurance world and i'm trying things and i get stressed out from what i'm doing because i'm learning more skills i'm dealing with people i just become better and better and better and i start surrounding myself with the right people and i start taking the principles that i learned in college and through sports And I started applying them to my life. And before I knew it, I woke up one day and I'm like, wow, I'm in a place where I'm actually achieving some type of success outside of athletics. And I felt good. And then I started moving more forward and momentum started gaining. So I just took the same principles from athletics after I healed and started trying things. And once I started trying things and started finding out what I liked, what I didn't like, what I was good at, and then found something to plug into and put my energy towards. And through time, uh, I healed and I started becoming successful and, you know, you know, fast forward, here I am. I love that. Yeah, it's the you know, beginner's mindset, right? You just got to show up and try and try and try. And um, funny you mentioned door-to-door. We said before we hit it record that you connected with Brandon Polzuk, who we've had here on the show. And he was on the live stream with Dave. I brought him on there too. And I just thought you guys would hit it off. So I introduced you and you guys talked. But I don't know if he shared with you, but he started out doing door-to-door sales. Um, hmm. He was selling fiber optic yeah, internet door-to-door. <laughs> So he said the same exact thing, getting your teeth kicked in was an exact phrase that he said to me. So, uh, and you guys are both very high caliber people. So there's something to that, right? Like you said, being prepared for everything. Um, yeah, it definitely takes a very unique individual to be able to go door to door. The thing is, even to myself today, I'm like, would I ever do that again? And like, I'm telling myself like, nah, I would hate that. <laughs> right. And so it's like, I've done it before. Like I've progressed and matured so much. And I'm like, still to this day, like, I'm like, nah, I mean, if I had to, I would, don't get me wrong. But right. It's definitely not a place that I want to go back to at all. Well, and that's the difference, right? You did it before cause you had to, now you've got options. So you wouldn't choose to do that again. Uh, it's something 100%. you mentioned, you mentioned try. And so this is by the time this episode goes live, um, this, this will be out there. I, I was, I filmed, a, I filmed, well, I did film a video about this, but I did a podcast too about this idea that came to me playing with my son. So we were playing with blocks 
and he was like, he's got these magnet tiles that are in different shapes. And one of them is a triangle. And he would kept calling it a try, or not a full triangle. And I don't know why the thought just popped in my head. I was like, man, a try angle, try with three, right? And so how many people would try once and it doesn't work and they just throw their hands up and say, ah, mm. oh, I tried. But really, mm. we should be trying with an I and going after it at least three times, right? Give it a fair shake before you just say it didn't work. Because what's really wrong with it, right? It's not that like you didn't try hard enough. It's that you try with a Y. Y for you, you know, didn't try enough. It's not the one time. It's the third time where it's going to click. And so your story kind of proves that, right? You tried so many things. You didn't just try one thing and then throw your hands up and say, oh, well, I can't do anything besides football, right? You just got to keep showing up and going after it. Yeah, that's a, a very unique analogy too. Uh, for you to have just came up with that on the spot, uh, that's very impressive. Um, I, I I like that. I appreciate that. Very creative, very entrepreneur like you of you. Um, <laughs> I got and, weird and, stuff that pops and, in my head all the time, man. It's it's yeah, but it works. Creative. It works I, for I, content I, now. Yeah, yeah, creative people. You know, they they can go far. They can tap into that creative power. Uh, it goes a long way. Uh, I'm trying to be as, as creative as possible right now with my podcast and with LinkedIn. This, specifically um i'm really trying to expand and be creative on there so i understand that creativity will definitely go a long way um but back to your back to your point though the the try try again thing there should really never be a point where you completely ever give up if you give up and let go then you are saying who you are as a human being that you are a letdown and a failure right and then no human should ever consider themselves as a failure it's just a point in time when you have not achieved what you're trying to achieve so if I'm trying, trying, and trying, and I fail, that's how I will become successful. You know, I'm I'm listening to the book right now with Jeff Bezos, um, and he's called the 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 Bezos Letters. Uh, have you ever heard of that? No, but I'll check it out for sure. Yeah, no, it's it's an incredible book, and he, there's like 14 principles in there that talk about um, how he built Amazon, and it wasn't him writing them. It was a guy who was a risk management that was kind of pulled the resources from different directions and pieced it together. Um, And based off of a letter that uh, Jeff Bezos did write, I think it was in like 1997, um, talking about the success of his company and the things that that they did to become successful during that time frame. And the number one thing or one of the biggest things he talks about is is failure. He's like, I don't know why people are so afraid to fail. It's like if we did not try and we did not fail on Amazon, we would not be who we are today. He talked about the story of how they how they failed with you know, certain shipping stuff and how they came across Amazon Prime and how they failed to get there before. And they failed in billions and billions with a B dollars of mistakes over and over. So they would never fail to the point where they're risking the the business, but they'll fail and risk so that they can, you know, course correct and, and figure out what's next and what's the next chapter. And so I think that is super important. Like people have to try and then fail. They have to try and then fail. And if you're never failing, you're never trying. And therefore, you'll never succeed. It's just point blank. You have to fail to become successful. And to really, success is all arbitrary, right? But that could be with anything. Like I have to go out and try to date somebody. And I have to fail in my relationships to then become the best person to deserve the next individual that comes my way. I have to fail with trying to figure out what, what, what diet works best for my body. I have to fail exercising. Like I have to fail in every area of life to learn the lesson to get on the right path for success. And so when it comes to your whole trying thing, like I get it, like people need to try, they need to try more, they need to try more often, and then they need to fail more and fail forward. By doing that, they'll achieve whatever it is that they, their North stars tell them to go towards. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it deserves a moment of silence after that, just for that to sink in to everybody. That was a great, uh, (laughs) great point. I totally agree with that. Um, So what, what was your biggest failure? Do you think let's, let's stay on this topic. What was your biggest failure? you know, leading up to the NFL and then after the NFL? That's a great question. Uh, the biggest failure is hard to pinpoint because there were so many failures. Um, you know, ah, man, Miles, I don't even know if I can answer that question just because I had so many of them but that pointed me to where I am at today. And to say what the biggest factor was that got me here, I think is almost impossible. It's really hard to pinpoint that. Um, sure. So I, I I don't know if I've ever not answered a question by somebody, 
But I feel like this is one question that I literally just cannot pinpoint of like, what was that one thing that got me here? Um, that, that, sure. that I said that was just the biggest failure. So and I'll take it because failure is an interesting topic for me because I get the sentiment of you got to fail to learn and fail forward. Right. But because of the way you just answered that too, that makes my point. Right. I, I don't know, like if failure truly exists, as long as you make use of it, like, was it really a failure mm. if it brought you to where you are now? Or did it just seem like mm. a failure in the moment? Or mm-hmm. is there such thing as like failure, like in retrospect, right? But like it, it, it evolves and then doesn't become a failure anymore as long as you build on it, right? So I always like to talk mm. about like, is it a setback or is it a failure? Good. Like, is it a bump mm. in the road and you continue to move forward? Or it's a failure because you just threw in the towel and said, I'm done. Well, then you failed, you gave up. You took your ball and you went home, right? Or you, you take your licks and you keep going. That's more of a setback, the one step back to take two steps forward, you know? So um, it's an interesting topic for me. It's something no. I love exploring with people. No, that's good. I think you pinned it right there on the on the head. Uh, and that's probably why I can't because every every lesson that I've taken, every every failure, quote unquote, uh, which is a setback, like you said, has gotten me to my where I'm at, which is in my mind, it's a success. So, and it's a lesson that I've learned. And I like how you position that as it being called a setback. Uh, I think when we're speaking about it, the word failure has like a more power behind it because people think of failure as like so detrimental. And so when you can be relatable to like, oh man, failed, like that's a big deal. Um, but I, at the end of the day, I came back from it. Right. right. And so by saying it that way, it, it sounds more powerful than saying, you know what, I had a setback, um, but now here I am. Right. Um, but if you're being super intentional about your wording, I think a setback is a way better synonym for it because it's true. Like I tried, I got set back for a second, but like I'm always moving forward, always moving forward. So I like the word setback. I'm being intentional about your wording. I think setback is the word that we probably should start using. Well, there you go. You're welcome to it. Make it yours. <laughs> yeah, trademarking it. There you go. It's fine. Um, I would, I'd like to just completely pivot the conversation and go back to one of the very first thing you said, where you said that uh, you gave your life to Christ at 18. And I'd like to talk about that, if you don't mind. I'm curious, you know, at 18, a lot of people grow up in the church, right? And not people, not people have those that realization at, you know, adulthood at 18. So what precipitated that for you? Yeah, so I actually did not grow up in the church really at all. Like, we'd go to church every once in a while. I still remember, like, the fourth grade, we'd go to church, you know, very uh, frequently. Um, and then after that year we hardly ever went to church on Easter and Christmas, et cetera. And I really did not know who God was. I knew of a God because I was at church, et cetera, but I did not know what a real relationship with God was. And so I get to college and you're right. This is a pivotal moment where most people just go off the deep end and go a completely different direction. But I get there, it's summertime, I'm 17 year old kid and highly influenced obviously by my surroundings because I'm wide eyed to everything that I see and, we get invited to this team barbecue and there's this guy who's over there just preaching the word and he's telling people, Hey, if, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. If you don't, you know, forgive yourself or if you don't, um, if you don't like turn away and repent, like you're going to hell. Like he would just say all these crazy things. Like you're going to hell, blah, blah, blah. Like you need to, you need to repent and God's going to condemn you. And he just went off on people. And I was like, wow, like this is a little extreme. Like what's up with this guy? Uh, why is he acting this way? But it was very unique to me because I was like, why is everybody turning away from him? But he's still out here doing this. So there is something very special about being different. It doesn't matter what scenario. If you're doing something different, you are going to catch somebody's eye in one way or another. Even if people think you're a little freakish or a little weird or what unorthodox, being different will allow you to stand out in any, any space, marketplace, your life, whatever you're doing, workplace, it'll help you stand out. Um, so ultimately, uh, I started gravitating towards this guy a little bit and we were teammates and he, him and I became good friends and I came to find out like he gave his life to Christ. Uh, another guy that played for the Dallas Cowboys, how mentor him. And I didn't even know what giving your life to Christ meant at that time. Um, but he just kept, you know, mentoring me and teaching me what the gospel was, which was good news and teaching me about who Christ was. And I started getting involved with FCA, which is fellowship for Christian athletes. And I started learning more about who God was and who Christ was and, you know, how he died for us and all these things. And, you know, during this time I hit rock bottom, like complete rock bottom. And when I mean rock bottom, I mean like complete depression. 
uh, suicidal uh, thoughts of just like, what is the point of being here? This life sucks. And from the outside, everybody would have thought I had it all, all put together. I had a girlfriend at the time that um, people thought like I had it, that I was going to marry. Um, I had a uh, division one scholarship to play at a very high level. I was starting, um, you know, I had everything that I could possibly ever wanted at this time. But the weight of the world on my shoulders, the the coaches, you know, breathing down my neck, competing against the, the people around me, being in a new environment, cold, windy place, not a whole lot of people, um, just uncertainty in life. Like through all that whole thing, I was just complete, completely lost. And, you know, I just felt empty and I just didn't know what to do anymore. And so like one day I'm like in my dorm room and I don't know, I'm just feeling empty and lost and depressed. And I just like start breaking down and like I, I fall to my knees and I just start crying, like tears just brushing down my face. And I just start talking to God and I say, God, like, I'm sorry. Uh, this life is not mine. Like, I, I don't want this life. If this is how I'm going to live it and if this is how I'm going to feel, like, please take it. And whatever you want from me, like, I'll do it. Like, please forgive me. Like, you're my king. I love you so much. And like, from that moment on, I had like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. It was like the depression, the heaviness, everything that I was feeling, just gone, just shoo, just in that moment. And it was just the most incredible feeling. And from there on going forward, I was considered in my mind, uh, just a brand new person, right? Christ says, and God says, you're like out with the old and with the new. And that was me. And so individuals from high school, like they would see me, they'd be like, dude, you're, that's not the same person you were in high school. Like what happened to you? Like, Oh, you're that Jesus freak now. Huh? Like you're the guy <laughs> that, that loves Jesus. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, that is me. Right. And that, that, that is me. That is who I am. Like I love Jesus and that's what it is. Um, and you know, coming back full circle back to the guy, I want to, you know, kind of defend him a little bit. When you first gave your life to Christ, you kind of are like on fire for him. You don't know how to express yourself. You don't know what to say. You don't know the right way to approach people. And that was him. He just gave his life to Christ. So he was trying to speak from the word and he's trying to express his feelings. Coming back full circle, he was like, man, I went about that all the wrong way. Like I wasn't showing people love and showing people grace, the important things of what Christ really stands for. Um, and so he, and he did that for me through our process. He showed me ultimate love, never judge me. Um, and that was the relationship that I really appreciated. Um, and so, you know, going forward, uh, that really changed my life. Uh, my junior year in college, I was the most focused I've ever been in my entire life. And it had everything to do with my relationship with Christ. I, um, did not do anything that entire year to, to the, to the depths of, I will, did not commit, like, I don't know where, where this level of, of show is at, but I would say I did not commit any sexual sin on any level for an entire year, like at all. Like not, not one time. And that was like the longest I've ever done any of that like that for in my entire life. You know, you talk about some of my background and my history. That was a big deal for me. Um, that entire summer, I, I went around the entire uh, country and spoke to people about my faith, about testimonies, about who I was. Uh, I went to kids camps and, and was a leader and taught them about how to combine sports and, and their faith. Um, you know, I went to Haiti. I went to uh, build an orphanage out there and teach them how to play football and, you know, built a water line and built a soccer field for them. And it was just an incredible experience. And through that focus and through that intentionality, I really was blessed. And like, I had the best year of football I ever had in my entire life. And I'm not necessarily saying that because I was being good or because I was, you know, you know, being a steward of God, like he blessed me with these gifts. But what I do believe is because I was so focused on him, I stayed away from a lot of the negative things in my life which allowed me to stay focused on what was important, which allowed me to focus on the prize of being an amazing football player, which helped me win games and be who I was. And so, you know, without Christ, like I wouldn't even have made it to the, the highest level that I made it to. So that is a huge piece of my life and you know, who I, who I am still to this day. Yeah. It's a powerful story. I appreciate you sharing that. And I was curious yeah, about it you. because for me, I grew up my grandfather on my dad's side was actually a pastor. So for me as a kid, it was just like, it was just everywhere all the time, right? It was just growing mm -hmm. up, church every Sunday. It was just like, it wasn't like a moment where like I found him for myself, right? It was like, I, he was always there, right? So it's always mm -hmm. interesting for me to, to talk to people that had a, just a different experience with that. And it's, um, yeah, it's, I appreciate you sharing. And it is interesting yeah. how some yeah. people, right? Like, um, like we said about being different, you get attention, and isn't it 
it's interesting because we've had a couple points in the conversation, right, where people talk about like there's a couple different t- ways of being different. Like there's the Jeff Bezos entrepreneur different, uh, talking about failing and people think he's the crazy guy, but his crazy is revered as brilliant entrepreneur. And then you got the quote unquote Jesus freaks who's crazy is seen as like like less than almost. I think it's I think for a lot of people it's just because they're so uncomfortable with it. Like they don't they can understand business and somebody like making a million dollars. They can't understand people having this connection with a person they can't see, right? Or uh, they just kind of project their own insecurities on the quote unquote Jesus freak uh, versus dealing with their own stuff. Yeah, and I think it's uh, the tangibles of like you said, like you can see one and not the other. And it's also coming back to the people that are Christians or that they call themselves Christians do give the, you know, the Christianity, the Christians a bad name as a whole. Um, you know, the Christian faith should be based around love, grace, uh, kindness, um, being meek, like all of these types of things. But you see a lot of Christians being in a complete different light of, of not being that, that helping can and not forgiving people and being angry and um, all of these different things. So because of that, people see Christianity sometimes as like this foo thing that um, it just means fake or they're, they're hypocrites at the end of the day. And if, if you've not really met a true believer, a true Christian, you know, you will think that Christianity is one thing versus like what it really is. And so it, I, I completely empathize with them. Um, you know, for, for people to see people as like these crazy Jesus freaks or they are, they think that Christianity is all messed up. It's because we've done a terrible job of society of portraying what uh, being a strong Christian man really is. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing within the world of finance. Like uh, you're talking about like specific, you know, products. If you set up a product a specific way, it can really do harm for a person. And then you hear somebody start talking bad about it. And it's like, okay, like you're right. It is a terrible product because you set it up wrong. But if you use this tool and you set it up properly, a very powerful product you just have to know how to set it up and how to use it and so everything has a place and the right place um and there's other things that have a wrong place and if you use it in the wrong way it could be very detrimental and it's the same thing when it comes to like you know liquor right um if you have a drink of wine like it's 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 fine but then all of a sudden you have like 10 drinks or 10 cups and you become detrimental now because you've overdone it and it could be the same thing with anything if you overdo something into some way or another um, and doing it in the wrong way, uh, it's just, it's not good. So, yeah, you're so right. Absolutely. Well, I want to bring, bring our, uh, our, our big question, I guess I'll say, right. What I ask every guest. So if you think about our whole conversation, right, we covered a lot from being a toddler, carrying your football around to the whole path to the NFL, what you're doing now, um, how you found Christ, everything in between, how would you summarize your journey, since this is relish the journey, how would you summarize it in three words? So the three words that I would use to describe my entire journey would be one is discipline, two is adversity, and three is perspective. And since those are only three words, I don't know if I'm allowed to elaborate, but um, yeah, please do. Those, those. Uh, okay, so. I, I like to start with the last one because I think it's very important um, to talk about perspective. And when I went to Haiti, it was unbelievable what I saw. I saw the most happiest individuals in my entire life. And the thing about it is they had no shoes. They had no food. They had no house. You talk about the slums. You talk about the ghetto. Now that is the ghetto. Right? There's no such thing as a ghetto here in the United States if you compare it to the slums in Haiti the poorest country in the entire Western hemisphere and is unbelievable what they do not have, but they are the happiest people in the entire world. So how can you have the happiest people in the entire world that have nothing, but then you come back to America and you have the people who have everything, but are super depressed, putting a gun in their mouth, taking pills, doing all of these things that are not leading to fulfillment. Like how do you have that? And it's because perspective, perspective will change you in every way possible perspective of having a a life that you can just breathe and wake up and just thankful and having gratitude versus a life of I'm comparing myself to the next person and I, I'm trying to get mine and I don't have mine yet and I'm trying to become successful and, and build a 
and build a kingdom, but uh, I, I feel like nobody's listening to me and it's all about you and you and you versus having a perspective of this world is bigger than myself. There's more to this world than me. Having that perspective will really change you as a human being. And so perspective really changed my life. And from start to finish, having that perspective on um, where I want to go and who I am and the things that I, the way I view the world really was, was everything and still is everything. And uh, discipline, you know, my story that I obviously shared shows how disciplined I was. And to this day, like I still, people will say like, Dom's the most disciplined person I know. Like you're so disciplined. You wake up early, you do this, you work out still. I do all these things. So people know me as like the disciplined person. Um, and obviously adversity comes through all the stories that I told and, you know, failing in football or a setback in football and coming back to becoming the man who I am now. So discipline, um, adversity, perspective, like those three words really defined who I was in my journey and also who I am to this day. Love it. Love it. So if people want more, more words from you. They want more of your journey. Where should we send them after the episode if they want more of Dominic Rufran? Yeah, let's give it to them. So there's two places. Uh, the first one is the podcast uh, on Apple or Spotify. It's called The Game Goes On. And like I said before, uh, that talks about uh, interviewing athletes, uh, former athletes, and hearing their story about how they became an athlete, their transition from athletics to life after sports, and how they became successful in their journey. Um, that's the first place. And the second place is LinkedIn. Dominic Rufran, that's R-U-F-R-A-N. Search me, find me, connect with me. Uh, I'm producing fire content on there all the time. Uh, I'm super engaging on there. And if you're not on LinkedIn, you're missing out because you need to. There's tons of opportunity there. You should be posting, engaging, building a network and a community around it. You'll meet the most amazing people. Um, so many opportunities will come from it. Uh, just another little nugget there. So yeah, those two places, the podcast and LinkedIn. Find me, search me. Let's connect. Awesome. Well, we will link to all that up in the show notes for anybody that wants to find you. And hey, I appreciate you taking about an hour, believe it or not, one quick. But I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to talk to me and for all the listeners here sharing your story. So thank you. Yeah, man. I had a ton of fun. Um, I loved it. You asked amazing questions. Uh, this was great. And so I hope your listeners got some type of uh, value from it. That'll do it for this episode of Relish the Journey. Very special thank you to all of you for hanging in there with us and listening to this slightly longer episode. But you can't cut off a guy like Dominic, right? What a great story. So many different layers to this guy. Each one of them awesome. Be sure you check out everywhere you can find Dominic in the show notes. And if you'd be so kind, go ahead, wherever you're listening to the show right now, drop us a review, drop us a rating. That's how we get to meet more people like you who are interested in relishing the journey. Cheers.